Lord be with you. And also with you. Please stand for the call to worship. God has equipped us to be people of truth. Come together to speak the truth. God has equipped us to be people of good works. Come together to work for mercy and justice. God has equipped us to be people of endurance. We come together strong in faith. We are so grateful to be here on this beautiful day to have these blessings from God, uh, not just for this day, but for this church, for our breath, for our life, for this chance to be in community. We take it all for granted. Let's confess to God how we do that as we join together in our prayer of confession. Deliver us, eternal God, from the sins which so easily beset us. We are disposed to receive prosperity from your hands as though the world were designed to serve our desires. We are prone to talk more of a high standard of living in our country and for ourselves than we are to seek a high quality of life. We are diligent in those matters by which we get ahead. We are too careless of those duties and dispositions by which we get right with you and with our neighbors. We have failed to discriminate between that which is good for us and that which can become good through us. Time and again, we have seemed to prefer to be high-handed rather than high-minded. Redeem us, O God, so that in humility, patience, and reverence, we and all the people of our land may possess our privileges in honor and use our prosperity to the glory of the one who gives it. In your name we pray, amen. There is nothing you have to do. There is nothing you have to do. There is nothing you have to do. God loves you just as you are. In spite of all evidence to the contrary, 
in spite of all we do to put, push God away. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ be with you. There's one, and there's two, and there's three, and there's four. Come over here. Good job. Around the font. We know what this is, right? What is this water all about? Baptism. Baptism. And what does that mean? What does that mean? Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? That means... Yeah, well, besides getting wet, it means that God loves you. you. That's right. That's right. So, yeah, we don't, need, we don't need to swim in it. It's okay. Yes. Yes, God loves you a whole lot, right? Yeah. And God loves you. <laughs> and so now, now we're going to come over here, and you know what we're going to do? We're going to, no, what do we tell these people? Right, yeah, we're going to tell them, peace be with you, right? You ready? One, two. Three, peace be with you. How did they know how to do that? It's like they're trained. Okay, well, it's time for us to go where we're supposed to go now. Good job, everybody. Thank you. Let us pray. 
Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do through Christ our Lord. Amen. The reading, the first lesson this morning is from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 32 through 39, and you will find it on page 141 in the Pew Bible. For ask now about formal aid, former ages long before your own, ever since the day that God created human beings on the earth. Ask from one end of heaven to the other, has anything so great as this ever happened? or has its like ever been heard of? Has any people ever heard the voice of a God speaking out of a fire, as you have heard and lived? Or has any God ever attempted to go and take a nation for himself from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs and wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by terrifying displays of power, as the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes? To you it was shown so that you would acknowledge that the Lord is God. There is no other besides him. From heaven he made you hear his voice to discipline you. On earth he showed you his great fire while you heard his words coming out of the fire. And because he loved your ancestors, he chose their descendants after them. He brought you out of Egypt with his own presence by his great power, driving out before you nations greater and mightier than yourselves to bring you in, giving you their land for a possession as it is still today. So acknowledge today and take to heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. There is no other. The word of the Lord. Our second lesson is from uh, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus in chapter 4, verses 6 to 11. We find this on page 951 in your pew Bible. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes to those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be associated with them, for once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Also reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, first 13 verses. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. This too is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Through these very human words, may your holy word be heard and lived. Amen. (coughs) 
Nancy and I had moved into this house on a little quiet cul-de-sac. There were maybe three houses there when we moved in. We now look around, we've been there for about four years and there are now seven houses. Not so quiet anymore. A few less trees. One day, one of our prospective neighbors came by to look at the progress of the house that they were building, just catty-cornered away from ours across the street. Not much to see, maybe, other than a port john and a dumpster, which aren't too attractive. But if you get beyond that, you also get beyond the memory of the beautiful trees that were once there. And you could see it would be a welcoming and opening open space sloping down to a creek behind. The slope is steep enough for a house with a basement and it looks like that's what has been started. The footings have been poured and the wood frames have been removed to reveal the foundation of a house. I think that's what Paul was talking about when he wrote to the Ephesians, foundations. He went all over the known world to preach his passion and to spread the good news of a God who even loves those who try to kill him. Of course, you know that was exactly what Paul was trying to do when he met the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. He was Saul then. But the impact of being blinded by the truth about who he was and how much Jesus loved him anyway turned him into Paul. As a result of this encounter, he spent the rest of his life sharing his joy with everyone he met all over the world. He almost died a couple of times in the process and eventually was murdered by those who had no interest in Paul's joy and also had the power to take his life. But until then, he worked tirelessly to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. I think that is what Jesus was doing that day when he came back to Nazareth. What strikes me about this text of Jesus coming home is the impossibility of Jesus being accepted in his own hometown. It's just not a matter of you can't go home again, as Thomas Wolfe would say, writer and patron saint of Asheville, North Carolina. It might be the un inability to believe either what you are seeing or what you are hearing because you don't have a context for it. You know that this is Joseph's son. You've seen him grow up. You know his history. You've seen him in his dad's carpentry shop. This is Joseph's son. So you put limits on what you see and hear based on that history your personal experience with him and your unwillingness to step out of your comfort zone limit what you can see and hear. Another author, Neil Donald Walsh, Walsh, who says, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. Hmm. Sometimes you just can't see for looking. It's a lot like the Native Americans who first spotted Columbus offshore. They had never seen a ship before, so they had absolutely no frame of reference in their lives for imagining anything like this. They were physically unable to see ships coming on the water. Suddenly men were on shore with them and they didn't know how they got there. I wonder if that's how folks looked at Jesus that day. Wait, 
Isn't that Joseph's son? So perhaps we have to start at the beginning, the very beginning. What is a church? Nowhere in Paul's words to the Ephesians is the word church ever used, at least not in these 16 verses. But it is clearly the subject. If I asked each of you to define church, we may get as many answers as there are people here today. My work as your intentional interim minister, they call us transitional ministers now, my work with you is focused on helping you define this word by helping you lead in new ways, coming together as one body in this wilderness of interim time. You know, we, we still compare ourselves to others, don't we? We measure ourselves in the church by age and title and length of membership and so many other things. It's really a defense mechanism when you think about it. The only real purpose served by all this comparing is to really help us justify why we shouldn't take responsibility. We're asked to serve, we're asked to give help and think, well, I'm not as smart as she is. She'll do it better. They have so much more talent in leading than I do. Well, she's been a Presbyterian all her life. Maybe for some people it's shyness. But even without our knowing it, when we focus on our differences, we end up rationalizing our way out of being part of the solution, being part of the body of Christ. What did Paul say he was trying to do? To equip the holy ones, he said, the saints, for the work of ministry. And that is the work of all of us. I have a surprise for you. You are the holy ones. You are the ones who are set apart to do the sacred work of revealing God in the world. Contrary to what you might think, this is not the work of your ministers alone, nor is it the work of your session or your deacons alone. It is not the work of your most influential members alone, the work of the body of Christ in the world is your job and your job and your job and your job. But what may surprise you even more is that you do this job every day of your life with every thought you have with every assumption you make, with every conclusion you draw, with every word spoken in anger, and every word of praise for another searching pilgrim. You are the body of Christ by the way you live each day. You know, if that's what Christ was teaching that day when he came home to Nazareth, is it any wonder they tried to kill him? So Nancy and I had just come home from shopping. We were unloading the car, and I saw a young couple who would soon introduce themselves as Tracy and John being led to our driveway by their three-year-old Nathan who was coming across the street to greet Maggie, our then 15-year-old yellow lab. We thought that Maggie had come out to greet us like she usually does when we go to the grocery store, but she walked right past us. I was relieving the trunk of its cargo, and I saw her go right past me, 
She was clearly on a mission. Just as I decide to turn around with my arms filled with bundles, I hear the welcome scream of delight coming from the end of the driveway. And I suddenly realize that Nancy and I are not alone. We are not the object of Maggie's affection on this particular afternoon. So, that's okay. Maggie loves children, especially little boys. So, with plastic bags of groceries in my left hand and an eight-roll pack of paper towels in my right, I join Nancy and Maggie with our new neighbors-to-be at the end of the driveway. John, Nathan's dad, extends his hand to me in greeting, and with a big smile, I drop the paper towels on the driveway so I can welcome him properly with a handshake and a smile of my own. And suddenly it hit me. That's what it's all about. As I glanced down briefly so that I wouldn't trip over what I was dropping, it all became clear to me as I watched those paper towels bounce on the driveway. This simple act of greeting was not getting his house built any faster. This saunter across the street was not putting more pressure on contractors to meet their scheduled deadlines. This Sunday afternoon stroll was not getting the lawn seeded or the yard landscaped. This act had no practical value in helping his family build a house. But it was doing something much more important. It was building a home. It was building community. So I'm wondering, is it the house? Or is it living together? Is it the church building, this institution we call church? Or is it working and laughing and crying and trusting and hoping with each other? I may be wrong, but I think it's all about relationships. It is being the holy ones of God, together with each other, together in the community, together with the world we are called to serve. some of whom will be our guests in just a few moments. Passing the peace on Sunday mornings here or making a meal for someone who was returning from the hospital or tutoring a child or volunteering for the community dinner doesn't balance the budget or increase the membership knitting a shawl or volunteering to help babysit for the mops moms, none of it makes any difference. But maybe it does. Maybe these acts, each and every blessed one of them, and so many others, are building the body of Christ And as we speak the truth in love, says Paul, we will grow up in every way into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love.
Please remain standing and let us join together in our affirmation of faith found printed in your bulletin. We believe in Jesus, Son of the one God, maker and sustainer of earth, sea, and sky, born of Mary's womb, faithful to the God of Abraham and Sarah. Jesus healed the sick, served the poor, and proclaimed heaven on earth, condemned by the religious and crucified by the state. He died, but transformed even death and rose to life everlasting. He blessed the disciples with his Holy Spirit and sent them forth, east and west, north and south. We commit ourselves to Jesus, to one another as brothers and sisters, and to his mission in the world, and to the grace of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Let us now come to God with those symbols of who we are as we worship God with our tithes and our offering.
Let us pray. Holy One, whose heart abounds with gifts, receive this offering as sign of our intention to live surrounded by your mercy, inspired by your spirit, open to the joy of your presence, hospitable to one another, and generous toward your world. Amen. So who would we like to remember? Well, there goes that microphone. So that has given me an opportunity to tell you that we are in the process of receiving bids for the sound system. So we will have to put up with this noise for longer. That's the good news. The bad news is you may have to hear my voice uninterrupted. Clear. the surprises which you bring on us. You take the lovely and cherish them. You take the unlovely and cherish them. The mediocre and make them gifted, the mere nobodies and ordain them your apostles. You entrust us with an authority and ministry far beyond our own We confess to you that we are reticent. Yet under your patient care, 
Sing it, all of you. 